morning, I'll be, uh, we're looking at the text that Todd read, and uh, part of the text deals with introducing Christ to people. And as I was thinking about uh, the, the lyrics in one of the worship songs that the blessings flow as far as the curse is found. And what, a, what an encouragement for those of us that can be the means in which these blessings go out because the curse is everywhere and the, and the effect that Christ has on this cursed world is, is one of dominance through his death. And so um, I couldn't sleep here, I don't know, a week or so ago, something like that. And what I do when I can't sleep is I pray. And uh, I, I figured God has kept me awake for some reason. And uh, one thing that I believe he was impressing upon me is that I need to go out into this community and uh, into the marketplace. And in our culture, that's all the local businesses. So I ask that you would pray as I go out and introduce Christ to people in these, lo in these local businesses. And Chuck, uh, faithful to God's uh, obedience, God's call on him, says, hey, do you need someone to go with you? I'll go with you. So we ask for your prayers as we go out that we might take Christ into the marketplace in this community. So definitely asking for, for your, your prayers on that. We want people to know Jesus and the joy that we have in him. So uh, before we look at the text this morning, look at the message, let's, uh, let's ask God's help. Father, you know that we bring many different thoughts and distractions, concerns, all these things from our appointed lives that you have given us into our gathering. And we ask, Father, that these, these ancillary thoughts and things would not be a distraction to hearing your voice, to hearing your spirit in us, that we might obey and have joy in Jesus. We want to know him. And as Tyler prayed before the message, that anything from me would not be received, but yet you would speak to us, that you would direct and lead your church. And we confess that we are in need of you. We are dependent upon your Holy Spirit to work and move in a way that lifts up the name of Christ and renews our minds and transforms us. So please help us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So I stumbled onto this recently. <clears throat> Rasputin, a Russian monk who dominated the Romanov family in their final years, taught that salvation came through repeated experiences of sin and repentance. He argued that because those who sin more require more forgiveness. Those who sin with abandon will experience even greater joy as they repent. Therefore, it is the believer's duty to sin. Oh, if he would have heard and heeded the words of the Apostle Paul. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? That's right. Make an auto. Strong negation. May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? The irony is, this deceptive monk died by his own philosophy when he was murdered by a gunshot wound to his forehead. Think of the joy his murderer must have felt as he repented from such a terrible sin. What lies. Why do you come to Jesus? 
It's one of the most probing questions anyone can ever ask of themselves. Why do we come to Jesus? Do we want a Savior who will permit us to sin, that grace may abound? Or are we wanting a Savior who is the Lamb of God who will take away our sin? Do we hunger and thirst for righteousness? Are we seeking a Savior who will give us this? There are many so-called saviors in the world that are vying for our attention and our affections. Daily, they demand our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. To reveal and expose these so-called saviors, do this. Look at your daily planner, your checkbook, most of all, your thought life. Who is in those places? These are things I do almost daily. So this is for me first. Is it Christ in those places? Now, if a few of you may be feeling conviction, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Let's find comfort and healing in the one highlighted in the scriptures. Let's look at the text. Verse uh, 35 of John 1. Again, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus and he, as he walked, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. So what is the first word in verse 35? Again. John doesn't seem to be concerned with new sermon content, does he? He will continue to hammer on this nail day after day, regardless of what people think. We know from, other, from the other gospel writers that, that John said a lot. But the core of his message is that Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now this message is provoking something in him when he sees something. Look at verse 36. And he looked at whom? Jesus. When this preacher sees him, it provokes a response. Even though on the previous days John tells us that he did not recognize him, until the Spirit came and remained upon him. But he cried out day after day the same message that Jesus is the Lamb of God. Now, what thoughts would come to mind to these Jewish people? The Lamb of God. Well, the Jewish Passover lamb would come to, come to mind, no doubt, in which a year old male without blemish would be kept until the 14th day of the month of Nisan. They were to kill it at twilight, spread the blood over the doorway, roast it with fire, eat it with unleavened, unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They were to eat it with their loins girded, that is to tighten up your pants and be ready. Have your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and eat it quickly. And then the angel of death would pass over them. The phrase Lamb of God would certainly invoke these thoughts. But prior to that, back in Abraham's day, recorded for us in Genesis 22, God commanded the unthinkable. Verse 1. And it came about after these things that God tested Abraham, and he said to, to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. 
And by and by, as his son Isaac are on their way to the mountain, Isaac is puzzled. In verse 7, Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. It is likely that these men would have heard these stories numerous times growing up in Jewish synagogues. Also, observing the Passover every year. The liturgy, the practices always involved animals, lambs. But John here says, here is the lamb. Look at the lamb. And what do we see but a man? Hebrews 10.5, therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. Jesus came to offer himself as the sacrifice to take away sin. Think about what is being communicated through the Jewish sacrificial system. Think about what was commanded to the Jews for 1,500 years prior to Jesus coming. That first at the tabernacle and then later at the temple, that the people were to bring an unblemished animal to the doorway of the tent of meeting or to the temple and slay the animal. Priests were butchers. Think of how much blood would be spilled out. Think about the sound that an animal makes as it would bleed out. And the people stood there saying, and the priest would pronounce that there has been an atonement for sin as you watch this animal bleed and die. Very grotesque. Think about, for years and years and years, they watched animals being killed over and over. And later, the author of Hebrews says that animals cannot take away our sin. You cannot kill the blood of bulls and goats. won't take away our sin. They were pointing to something greater. And then the author of Hebrews tells us, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And yet, we have Christ, in whom all of the sacrifices were pointing towards. And He is placed upon that altar. When before, for 1,500 years, they would, when the animal would die, they would cut up the animal, and certain parts had to be placed outside the camp, and certain parts were placed upon the altar and burnt as a pleasing aroma to the Lord, it says. And Jesus comes as that sacrifice. And His blood is shed. He is the Lamb of God that takes away our sin. This very graphic sacrificial system is communicated to us that we might look to Him as our final sacrifice. The Holy God become a man for us. That He might die in our place. How do we approach Jesus in, these, in light of these things? Back to our probing question. Why do we come to Jesus? How many of you here are using red letter Bibles? Yeah, I do. If you've noticed, Jesus has yet to speak so far in this gospel. It's all black until verse 35, or 38, excuse me. But, the true mark of a gospel preacher is to not have people following them, but following Jesus. Look at verse 37. 
the two disciples heard John speak, heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What do you seek? Jesus, who never had pride or desired the praise of men, goes right for the throat. What do you seek? Verse 38, they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to him, come. He said to them, come and you will see. So they came and they saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. That's about four o'clock on our our clocks, Jewish, the Jewish day started at 6 a.m. So, this is the question that Jesus asks of every one of us who follows him. What do you seek? He will expose the motives of our hearts. Why are we following him? He will often lead us into uncomfortable places. But here's what we can learn from these men. Keep seeking Him. Keep seeking Him. He is worth it. He, he will expose us in our wrong motives, if there are any. He will expose us. That's for our good and His glory. He will expose wrong motives. But keep pursuing Him. Ask Him, where are you staying so I can be with you? I know I'm messed up. I know I've got serious baggage. But you alone have the words of eternal life. I'm not leaving you. That is faith. One of the marks of a follower of Christ is that you can't keep them to yourself. In spite of the fear, we can't keep them to ourselves. Verse 40. One of the two who had heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found first his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. Verse 42, he brought him to Jesus. So when we have experienced this Lamb of God who takes away our sin, we must introduce people to Him. After all, those who have experienced Him have girded their loins, their sandals are on, their staff is in their hand. They're ready to go tell the lost of this world that there is a Lamb who can take away their sin. He can deal with the guilt in their conscience. Wow, what a cleansing lamb. Now, what is our response? Will we forsake or follow? There is no in-between. Notice what happens next. Look at verse 42. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. What is going on here? We talked about that a little bit in our membership class, where Jesus just looks at, at Peter, which we typically know him as, as Peter, and, and he just says, it's not your name anymore. That's strange. We talked about this in our membership class a little bit, that names... For people that, I'll take Paul for example, say when I bring, people that know Paul Kino, if I were to say the name Paul Kino, someone that knows him, all of these thoughts about Paul are going to come to mind, about where he lives, what his occupation is, the experiences they've had with him. Everything about Paul is represented by his name. His desires, who he's married to, all of this. When Jesus, when you have an encounter with Jesus, what is being communicated here is, trust me, He gives you a new identity. 
He totally gives you a new identity. People look at you funny then, right? When people say you're with who? Jesus. He gives you a totally new identity. He says you're not this anymore, you're this, because your identity is in Him. So he says, you're Cephas. In Christ is a new life. In Christ is a new life. Not without problems. Peter communicates that to us clearly. Not without problems, not without falling down and skinning your knees, but a new life. So again, we see that the followers of Jesus bring others to Him. For these Jews, if they had really believed that they had found the Christ in whom Moses and the Law and Prophets had wrote, how could they not tell others? That would be inconsistent with what they said that they actually found. We've found the Messiah. If you've actually found Him, how can you not tell others? In the same way, if we have truly met the One who has forgiven us of all our sins and given us the free gift of eternal life, how could we not tell others? In spite of our fear, but to tell others about Him. Now, a common response is, well, I don't really want anybody to make fun of my beliefs. Verse 46, Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> Translation, I seriously doubt you found the right guy. You're an idiot. <laughs> you will encounter all kinds of skeptics. People today will mock you, they'll make fun of you, they may even reject you personally because of your faith in Jesus Christ. But stand firm. Be persistent and consistent in your faith. Continue to introduce people to Jesus. He'll take care of the rest. Verses 47 to 50. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him. And said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. Only Jesus can deal with the unbelief of man. Only Jesus can deal with mockers and rebels, converting them into followers. And if you want a more contemporary example, how about the preacher that's standing in front of you right now? I was that guy. I was more than a skeptic. I was a mocker and a rebel. I love our God who converts his enemies. That is amazing. I love that about him. Now, many of you know exactly what I'm talking about in that. So that is the encouragement that God gives us, the grace that He gives us to know that we were once there, and we can take this awesome message of forgiveness of sins, eternal life, His resurrection into the world, knowing that He will continue to do this. <clears throat> now, here's the issue. People, people are drowning in the delights and the deceptions of our culture. They're seeking to find pleasure and solace in God's stuff instead of God Himself. What can we do? What can we say that can affect the human heart? 
the desires of the heart, the covetousness, we present Christ. In our story today, Jesus is dealing with Jewish men. So, he puts their eyes on the text of Scripture in order to put their eyes on Jesus, because all Scripture bears witness to, to Christ. Look at verse 51. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, he's still speaking to Nathaniel, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, which most of you are, like Nathaniel would have been, you know exactly what Jesus is referring to here. But if you're not, Jesus is referring to Genesis chapter 28. Genesis 28, in this passage, if you want to turn there, I think Todd will have it up here in a second. Genesis 28, Isaac had just spoken to Jacob and had given him instructions about future marriage. So Jacob is on his way to go out and find a wife. I'll say this a lot as we go through the gospel. Notice that the things that are in the content of the gospel itself is placed there very carefully. And I find it interesting that the next, next tomorrow, or uh, next Sunday, we will actually be at a wedding at the beginning of chapter 2. So Jacob is on his way to go find a wife. And we'll pick up the story here in Genesis 28.10. Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went to Haran. He came to a certain place and spent the night there, because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. He had a dream, and behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, and to the north and to the south, and in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. <clears throat> then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, <clears throat> Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So here is what Jesus is saying to Nathaniel. Here's what the Apostle John is saying to us. Jesus is saying, That's me. I'm the ladder that's on the earth with the top that reaches to heaven. I am the house of God. That's what Jacob named this place. I am the Bethel, Jesus would say. He's the gate to heaven. He's the I am. So when we bring people to Jesus, this is the Jesus they will meet. He will expose us. He will change our identity. He will change our minds, and therefore we will see him for who he truly is. He's the Son of God. He's the Son of Man. He is God himself. He alone saves with his strong right arm. Introduce people to him. We are just butlers and maids in the kingdom of God. We serve Him. We want people to experience Christ. 
There is no greater calling for Christians. There is no greater joy for a sinner, and God delights in saving sinners. We will see this over and over again in the Gospel of John. And He has done this to us. To us. Praise His name. 